I would like to introduce the next speaker is Peter Holtzman. We are colleagues here at IOW. Uh, he is originally from uh, Bremen and he studied physics here in Rostock at the Rostock University. Um, yeah, it was during the master's or early, early student times when he got into oceanography and uh, got cut. Uh, he uh, was cut by it and he decided to uh, dedicate his, his, his life to it. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, in any case, um, yeah, he's um, uh, focusing on uh, hybrid models, uh, combining observations and numerical computation models. Um, and he's particularly interested on mixing of stratified water masses. Yeah, so he, um, that that's uh, pretty much it. Please, Peter, the stage is yours. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. So um, I thought this is a good picture to start because it's uh, in terms of temperature, super different from, from what we have seen before. So um, um, we made a cruise, which was the coldest cruise I ever had in the Baltic Sea, and that was minus 10 degrees. It was so cold that the whole ocean was basically boiling and I found it very nice. So the, I'm going to show data from this cruise also, a, a little bit at least. Okay, so um, our intention was to compare to oxygen deficit zones and I try to make an introduction. And I think the biological introduction is almost a joke for you guys, but still I do it. And then I do the physical transport introduction. I hope you learn a little bit more. Okay, so um, the Baltic Sea um, is in Central Europe. So you can see here Europe, and this is Sweden, this is um, UK, and here is the zoom with the Isle of Gotland here, and um, we call this the Gotland Basin. That is the Central Baltic Sea. It's 240 meters deep in its maximum, and in average, the, the basin maybe is something like 100 meters or so. And if you look on a profile, uh, okay, and the IW is here, by the way, so in, uh, in Rostock. So if you make a CDD profile here, it looks like this. So your salinity, it's brackish. So it's 10, uh, 12 PSU um, at the bottom. And at the top is something like seven or so. In the middle, you have this halo cline, which is um, a massive transport barrier. And with oxygen, you see that um, it's well oxygenated at the top then it strongly decreases at the halo cline. It comes back a little bit and then it goes to zero. Okay. Um, if you look, which is called um, anoxic water mass here. And um, if you look over time, um, you can see the evolution of this anoxic water mass. And almost 100 years ago, we haven't had any of these anoxic water masses. So everything was suboxic basically with a little bit. Um, but human impacts took its effect and the, the um, anoxic water mass has actually increased over time to its state at the moment here. So we have um, main parts of the central Baltic Sea are anoxic. But maybe to, yeah, okay. Um, that has an effect on the surface as well. So in summer we have these cyano cyanobacteria blooms and they look very beautiful from the space. They actually know a lot of physical oceanographers start to love the Baltic Sea, even people from the US, because you can nicely see like mesoscale eddies and um, uh, fronts here. So this picture is actually in many publications now. When you go with a ship, it's not so nice anymore. You see here this cyanobacteria. So there's a economical threat also f coming from that. Okay, what I wanted to say is, so the areas of anoxic water are increasing, but if you look at the bathymetry, the amount of water which is actually anoxic is due to the shape of the Baltic Sea, not as high as um, the map basically suggests. It's still one of the largest anoxic water masses in the world. And um, a reason for that is the halocline, as I said already. So that's a 
a massive transport barrier for turbulence and mixing, basically. And a lot of my talk will be about um, how this halo client can still be overcome by transport processes for oxygen. Okay, so now my um, small little um, biological introduction, my understanding of an oxygen deficit zone. So at some point we have a primary production. So we have in the euphotic zone, we have um, a lot of organic material. At some point it dies and it sinks down, okay? And because our Baltic Sea is very shallow, only 250 meters, it sinks down so fast and it is not decomposed within the water column, but it comes to the sediment like so. Okay, and that means we still have our halo line here and we have a lot of organic material at the base and bottom and that wants to be decomposed and it naturally demands oxygen for that. That's the, the most efficient way to decompose it. Um, that doesn't happen because oxygen transport is inefficient and that uh, gives us, us a fluff layer in the deeper parts and a nice sand layer in the upper parts. And I'm gonna show you now two examples from our microstructure probe equipped with a GoPro. So here, that is sand that is just above the halo line and just, um, I think it was 600 meters away and maybe 10 meters deeper, the, the whole thing looks like this. So you have this fluffy sediment. This is only five centimeters now and it can come become, uh, it can have half a meter in the center of the Baltic Sea. So not very nice, but that's how it is in an anoxic area actually. So except for bacteria, nothing lives there. Okay, um, so how do we overcome the halo line anyhow? So there is an oxygen transport and we try to figure out how much it actually is. So we want to close the oxygen budget of the Baltic Sea basically. And um, one effect would be advection. So that means we have dense water coming from, let's say the North Sea and that dense water has oxygen and it basically is denser than the halo line and goes into the basin like this here. That would be one process. The other process would be turbulent mixing, this one here. And um, the thing with turbulent mixing is that people have found out over the last, uh, I would say decades, that it's strongly heterogenic in space and also in time. And it basically means that if you go into an interior of any stratified basin, may it be the ocean, the Baltic Sea or a lake, mixing is always very low. So when you go here mixing, I made this little words here only, it, it's basically zero almost all of the time. If you go to the basin boundary where the currents interact with the boundary, mixing is high, which is here. Um, and that has an effect on the oxygen fluxes. So you cannot simply measure here and extrapolate it to the whole basin, but you need to know the processes on different time scales and spatial scales. Okay, and um, that is basically the work we have done the last 10 years, I have to say, um, and I was always also surprised. So um, I worked on several projects and they looked at um, the mixing rates interior, um, which is small, but have a large area. We looked at the mixing at the base and boundary and we looked at the seasonality of mixing and we looked at the advection. And what we wanted to find out is, um, so we basically all these processes have been known, but we wanted to put numbers on that. And um, then a funny thing is, uh, I mean, funny for a scientist maybe or for a nerd, that um, when you have mixing at the boundaries, you have oxygen flux at the boundaries, but at the same time you have oxygen consumption at the boundaries. So the question is how much of this oxygen is actually effect, effect, effectively transported into the interior of the basin. Okay, and we basically doing that with in situ measurements because our models are simply not good enough to resolve these mixing processes well. We are working on that, but at the moment it's not possible. And I would like to show you the instruments we have done, uh, used over the years or still using. And um, 
our most beloved in instrument is this microstructure probe, this one here. I guess you all know it maybe if you have ever seen people from the IOW, we always bring that with us. Um, we feel naked without it. So um, that measures turbulence. And um, actually we combine it with the very fast oxygen sensors because our gradients are so strong to get the oxygen fluxes. Then we have this um, underwater mooring, which is basically a winch, which is going up and down all the time to get the temporal scales better because uh, going with the ship is always a big effort and you are hopelessly undersampling the whole system. Okay, I, and what I mean with it, I'm gonna show on the next slide, this one here, that is actually data from the goddess here in the center of the basin. And we have it in there for many, many years now. And um, it basically makes a data set like this. This is different deployments. This is the time here on the bottom. And maybe you only focus on the oxygen. So the row number C basically. So that is zoomed in. So it's um, stopping at 70 micromoles. Um, everything above is nice and oxygenated with 300 or something. And what you see is the anoxic water, nice and blue. And in the middle, you see this, um, we call it um, hypoxic transition zone. So sometimes you have oxygen, sometimes not, then you have a lot, then you have nothing, then you have a whole deployment, nothing, then a little bit, but no intrusions. So a lot of things going on here in this um, area. And we analyzed the whole data set and we came to the conclusion that we cannot explain all these um, things with mixing, but this water has to come from the side basically into the basin. And maybe one hand waving argument is this profile here. So if you have oxygen, it goes to zero and it comes up again. Um, diffusion is most likely not um, the process, right? Because diffusion always smooths the profile. So we are pretty sure that this water comes from the site into the basin. And we could actually, um, we could actually quantify that. And I made another sketch of the Goodland Basin here. And what we did was we basically looked at the consumption rate in the basin and compared it with the, with the inflow. And what we found is that um, we get an import of 30 to 60 gigamoles per year into that area. The complicated thing is, is similar to the Benguela system, it's open. So it's not closed like here, but water can also go out on, on the right-hand side on my screen. Um, so you have to kind of take that into account, which makes it complicated, but it worked out. And what we also found is that the interior consumption is very low, except, um, so there is a little bit, but we can explain almost everything by consumption into the sediment which was also new. So there was always a debate, what is consuming actually? And in the case of the Baltic Sea, it seems to be the sediment with let's say 90% or so. When we, when we wrote that, we simply assumed that vertical mixing is not important because we couldn't measure it and the data kind of suggested that. But at the same time, we um, started a second um, project which actually looked at the mixing and this is, three examples of a transect at the slope of the boundary. And um, what I only want to show here is how, um, how yeah, heterogenic the turbulence is. This is again, the dissipation rate. Natalia also showed that. And maybe look at this here. So this is winter. So it's white everywhere. So that's the noise level of the instrument. So no mixing in the interior water column, except at the basin boundary. So here we have mixing. Um, if you go to summer, which is this one here, we have a little bit of mixing at the, at the bottom and again, nothing in the interior. So nothing happens there, very boring. If you have a nice storm, this is directly after the storm, mixing is also in the interior occurring, but that is only for let's say two or three days and then it's calm again. Okay, we made a lot of MSS profiles, actually 1,700 1, and something and um, if you do that, people get mad, but you can make nice averages after that. And when you do that for the three seasons, we get an average dissipation rate here, again, from the noise level, 10 to the power of minus nine to a lot of turbulence for the Baltic Sea, 10 to the power of minus six. And here's again, the, the slope of the transit. And you see the nearer you come to the slope, the higher gets the, the turbulence. 
The same for the autumn cruise, the green one, a little bit more turbulence. And in winter, everything was pretty high in terms of turbulence. If you now take the oxygen profiles and make fluxes, everything becomes more wiggly here. Um, and you see here the oxygen flux in millimoles per square meter per day. And um, 10 millimoles per square meter per day is kind of a canonical value of the oxygen uptake in the North Sea. So that is when you put a, what is it, um, a chamber lander into the North Sea. You measure 10, basically, just to give you an idea. Um, in autumn, we have a lot of oxygen flux, but only at the base and boundary. Um, in summer, it's low, except for some mixing events here. And in winter, it, it is doing something everywhere, but not as high as in autumn. So we see a strong seasonality of the mixing. And um, I'm actually happy to see that because I had to run three cruises actually to and to justify three cruises. And that was a big effort actually. And we found this nice um, seasonality. Yeah, and it's actually the first time we could really measure that. So there were a lot of, let's say, um, hints in that direction, but we could measure that. Okay, and if we again make a sketch and refine our, um, our budget of the central Baltic Sea, um, we can say, okay, we have an import of 30 to 60 gigamoles per year of oxygen by advection. And then we try to be smart and extrapolate our, our transects at the basin boundary towards the whole basin, which is, um, I don't know if it's brave or if it's crazy, but I, I, we still did it. And um, we had some arguments how to split the areas and we defined an edge region, which is the light yellow here, an intermediate region here and the interior region. And if you look at the numbers, the edge and the interior, re uh, the intermediate regions, they give something like 20 gigamoles and the, the interior region only five. So with five, I would say, okay, that's an order of magnitude less compared to the intrusions. But with the other one, they, they have to be taken into account into the budget. The only thing is that the fluxes, if you look at this figure here, um, this is again a, um, an average over one season, it's winter. And these are the oxygen fluxes at three isopycnodes basically. And you see that fluxes are high at the basin boundary, but become basically zero, or not far away. So that is only, I don't know, five kilometers away or so. And these fluxes are in direct touch with the sediment. So they are probably directly consumed within the sediment. And that would mean that this one here is not actually seen in the center. So if you have a profile like this, that is not the oxygen which was mixed at the boundary. That would be a thesis, basically, a hypothesis. Um, we don't know yet what, was this, what is happening with the oxygen. So uh, in this case, we, we, are, we need to have a numerical model to, to um, resolve these processes. But that is work in progress. And um, um, I hope to, or we hope to get some, some results out of that. OK. Thanks a lot. That's from my side. And that is um, my closing picture. And I wanted to show you this picture because I was already have been on one cruise in Namibia. And as you can see, you can have a bath even on the ship when others are working and trying to find um, filaments of temperature within uh, of the coast of Namibia. So yeah, thanks. And I'm really happy if you have questions. Thank you so much, Peter. Very interesting talk. It's probably very refreshing to work in a system that you can pretty much close and <laughs> and uh, yeah, a bit less dynamic and. Uh, yeah, the the closing. Um, we we're all, already all also surprised that it seems to be at least with the the error margin is large, but it it seems to be possible at least. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
even in an area which is open basically so yeah. Yeah. things can't go to the left and to the right yeah simon seems to have a question um i have like a, a question regarding the probably the overall a kind of like take home message but like especially like the the, the last slides so if i if like to condense it down you said like uh, overall like this uh, intrusion of like um uh, oxygenated water from the left in your in your sketch is like probably the more important process but there's like some vertical mixing and like the strongest in the winter so i as that is like is that like kind of like caused by a winter storms or like winds but then yeah. you showed like there's like it seemed to be at least you, you didn't explicitly say it but like there's like an interaction is there an, would you say there's an interaction with like the winds causing this vertical um uh mixing and like the sediment bottom and like uh, only if you have both together you have like a you have a stronger kind of like exchange than like if you have a deeper basin yeah exactly so um so the vertical mixing is basically by by storms and winds so that's the reason uh -huh. why you have it in in um autumn and in winter but we also looked at the the um the intrusions and they d don't show a, like a seasonality so they do something and they are much more complicated because they are they come from the north sea and they come when the density difference is um the right the right density that it can intrude into the basin okay that is much more complicated and it doesn't show a seasonality maybe something like a decadal thing or so yeah so like the minus five versus minus 11 is, is that a combination of like those two processes or is it like is like the minus 10 to minus 11 and like that sketch here which is like a closer to like shallower um, uh, that is a... that's like caused by like the interaction between like something at the bottom with like the wind yeah that um this minus five minus ten and minus eleven that is um the yearly averaged so that okay. takes into account the summer autumn and winter and we took the autumn as the spring to make it as worst as possible, let's say like this, or as strong as possible in terms of the oxygen yeah. flux. Yeah. Did I, was it, did I answer the question or? Yeah, thanks. Kurt uh, seems to have a question, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Peter. It's amazing, isn't it? what we can learn from smaller and smaller and smaller ecosystems that have these two parts, an oxic and an oxic part. First we look at the Venguela welling, then we look at the basin, it could be the Black Sea or in this case now uh, the Baltic, and then I have a mountain lake that's, that's meromictic, it means also it has no oxygen in the bottom. So a lot of what you said reminded me so much about what's happening in that mountain lake. You, you used this to explain why you have a uh, local minimum, oxygen minimum, but oxygen below the halocline or almost at the transition. And you claimed that this was uh, low from the side to those steps, right? That was oxygen had been produced further up and then it was transported down is that did i understand that correct yes that is exactly the our oh, argument would you say that's terrestrial derived water um i would i mean eventually the water or came from the north sea where it was well mixed then it took all the way through the chain of of basins we have in the west of the Gotland basin and at that time, it already lost oxygen, but also um, entrained other oxygen. So it's a complicated mixture of water, North Sea water and brackish water from the Baltic Sea. And why would that not mix in? It has almost the same salinity as your deep water. Yeah, that, that is a really interesting question. And it's, it's amazing, right? I mean, if you look at these, um, we, we are puzzled with that as well. And we... we um, we have simply observed it, so we don't have a, um, an answer. So if you look, for example, on this patch here, you see it for many days, basically. And you can 
maybe you can or this patch and maybe that patch is the same patch and um, the reason we think is um, they are oxygen patches I, I imagine always like a pancake so a pancake goes into the basin so it's maybe I don't know 100 kilometers times two meters thick or 10 meters thick and it doesn't mix vertically because there's no mixing vertically and it simply is doing a pancake thing in the basin. And at some point, this pancake touches the boundary. And there it comes in contact with um, the sediment. Oxygen is consumed. And the water is basically mixed vertically also. And then, then this mixed vertically water goes back into the basin as another pancake, maybe five meters higher. Mm -hmm. But within the water mass, it's lamina. Nothing happens with that. So. Um, so these water patches, they have lifetimes of roughly a month. And actually, um, our biology department, they try to treat it as a, let's say, as a labor laboratory. So there's a little bit exchange, but they do, they are independent, basically. Mm -hmm. That is our explanation for that, that they live so long. Yeah, there are probably many more different ones, but uh, let's not talk about those. I was more interested in finding out why is your deep water so much more turbid than the surface water? The surface yes, water. very good question. We don't know. Um, so we have asked a lot of... Um, oh, this profile is perfect, basically. So what you see is when you have oxygen, it's not turbid. But whenever you have um, um, a, a deep decaying oxygen and the start of an anoxic water mass, it suddenly starts, becomes turbid. And um, when you look at, at, for example, this profile here, you, you see it nicely here. So you have here an oxygen patch and just below the oxygen patch, it's turbid. And the same here, mm -hmm. but you also have patches down here. And what we think is that this is old water, which was oxygenated and when the oxygen the oxygen decayed, but the turbidity is still there. And our hand-waving explanation without being a chemist, someone from the chemistry, is that it's molecular sulfur. So you have oxygen and you have H2S, and there's an intermediate product, which is um, molecular sulfur. So it's when you look in a CTD video camera, it's totally white. It's like a milky thing. And... and um, but nobody could really explain that. But you see it in a lot of anoxic systems, basically. It's always sure, this. Sure, sure. Yes. But uh, then you would have to have the next question. Where does that come from, etc. But has anybody looked at the particulates otherwise? Is it organic? Is that make the turbidity? No, it's... Um, I, I only know that a postdoc burned his fingers on that and that many people looked at it. And um, I haven't seen a reasonable explanation for that. You can reproduce it. You can put a tank on a ship full of anoxic water, and then you simply put a little bit of oxygen water, and poof, it becomes white. You cannot filter it. You, it's it's something very small, and it. I don't know. I don't know what it is. So, if someone from chemistry is interested, I think that is a very interesting open research question. So, um, I would love to have someone answer that. So. Uh, I think it's a really nice question. Thank you, Peter. So, Peter, may I ask a technical question on how uh, did you do the calculation of the fluxes? I think it's in one of your last uh, slides. This one here? Maybe? Yeah, that one here, yeah. So you said that uh, is the arrow of these fluxes uh, has to do with the integrated depth uh, that you use? I mean, probably because it's very stagnant water, you use the, the uh, Fick's law for, for calculating it. Um, correct me if I'm guessing wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I wonder if uh, there is an integration over the different uh, water depths or is just like points uh, for every data measured, uh, are you calculating a flux? Yeah, actually, um, so that was the master thesis of Ole, and we thought it's an easy thing, but when you start to average fluxes, um, it was a year-long pain, basically, pain in the neck. 
Um, <laughs> what we turned out to do is we we averaged everything on isopycnals, and then um, so what you basically do to measure a flux is you have the dissipation rate, you have the stratification, and you have a thing called the mixing efficiency, which is a turbulence parameter which is not well known basically. So the ocean guys say it's 0.2. The, the coastal guys say it's a complicated function of another thing called the buoyancy Reynolds number. And there's no agreement on that. And if you go to a turbulence um, conference, half of the talks will only deal with this mixing efficiency, apparently. And we tried different ones. So this one's the Xi et al, I don't know, 2012 or so, mm -hmm. who did a lot of simulations. And that seems to be the most reasonable. And um, so you have, but basically what you do is you take your oxygen gradient, you take a diffusivity derived from the microstructure and you multiply it. That gives you a flux. Mm -hmm. And this flux we average on an isopycno and then we average over, over these areas here, basically. Mm -hmm. And if we don't average, you don't see anything because it's just mm -hmm. turbulent wiggle without anything you can notice. So that, that is actually a very, let's say, processed figure already. Mm. Yeah, I think there is like uh, different studies dealing with that at the moment. We are also trying to make the calculations somehow uh, in a um, comprehensive way because we have very also high resolution measurements and we wanted to use it them. Yeah. So, yeah, but yeah, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, we also played around. Um, I mean, you have the oxygen signal and the microstructure signal. And if they, if you shift it because your sensor is slow or fast or so, that already makes a lot of difference by let's say a factor of five. So it's, it's, it's really complicated. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and we have different uh, measurements from different nutrients collected uh, with another device. So you oh, yeah. still mm. first have to fit the, these two data sets and then make the calculations. Well, it's working at the moment. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if someone else have uh, more questions, but otherwise, um, if everyone everyone is happy, uh, we can close this seminar. <laughs>